things. I've just picked off the old bramble bush. I've always had a bit of a conflicted relationship with wild berries because, ooh, oh, that's the one. They taste amazing, but yet they're always growing in the wrong places and you're always trying to cut them back and then they grow back stronger. Why is it that the best tasting thing in my garden is also the thing that I'm trying to cut back the most? One of life's quandaries that I'm not sure I'll ever answer. Welcome back, guys, to the whatever this is. Figure it out as we go along conversations or monologues, rather. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video on should we fly anymore? It's a painful and annoying one, and the response was really good, especially from you guys on Instagram. Really surprised, I think, for conversational stuff. It's a good platform. So loads of you did send me links and ideas, and I'm going to try and go through them and carry on following the rabbit hole a little bit further. Also give you some updates. I'll give you those updates at the end, but let's get right into it air travelers may have to pay carbon charge to offset emission. This is kind of the idea I came up with, right? That I'm going to put 50% or 100% of the ticket price straight into carbon offset. And this is trying to make a carbon charge standard so it's out of our hands. A bit like when we're made to wear seatbelts in our cars because we're not to be trusted to figure it out on our own or there's no point in giving people the option as if it's not a, a moral imperative. So check that article out. Very interesting. Be interesting to see if there's a change org website or whether that's managed to get its way through to parliament that could be a really important thing for us to follow up a group called flying less or flight free 2020 i'll put this link in as well so this is an initiative to get loads of signatures at attacks on aviation fuel which is kerosene so this is a more practical approach that's interesting quite a transnational Petition. I'm not really sure. Anybody know anything about the European Commission and whether or not it uh, has power to put in laws like that? So quite quickly as you go down the rabbit hole of flying, it becomes clear that carbon is the currency. Whether you're looking at flying or other parts of your lifestyle, it's all part of the same story. I found this very interesting paper from Bjorn Hedin of how much CO2 do I emit from the Royal Institute of Technology Stockholm in Sweden. It's a PDF. It's well worth looking at. Very digestible trying to look at different countries. USA is up at over 20 tonnes of CO2 per capita. That is very interesting. 2010 is down to, let's say, 18 from 21 in 1980. So it does seem that they're coming down very ever so slowly, and the UK down from 11 to 8 or 9 tonnes of CO2 per capita. But if I go back to my calculator, calculator, Oh, calculations. I think I was coming in at over 20, so worse than the average American, which doesn't feel great, to be honest with you. The scary thing, and I'll screenshot this and show it to you, is the bit where you realize that the sustainable level is two tons of CO2 per capita. So even at the UK average level, we're still five times over, if Bjorn is to believe, believe. Since the last video, I've actually bought a hybrid electric which I love. It only does 30 miles on electric. So some days I feel, bless you, some days I feel completely efficient and like I'm right on the right team. And other days where, like one night, I plugged it in in the car but forgot to plug it in in the house. And so I had zero electric and it probably only ran at 35, 40 miles to the gallon, which I could do more effectively in a smart car or in any kind of, like my dad's Volvo runs 65 miles to the gallon on diesel. That's probably more efficient. However, this is cracking the door open every day. I'm thinking about electric every day. Some days for three days in a row, I run purely on electric in the car and that feels good. It's also true that that electric may not be coming from sustainable sources, but there's a good chance that it will become sustainable. Whereas we know where the fossil fuel story ends. And on top of that, talking with my friend Vince the other day, it's very possible that hydrogen from water is the most sustainable long-term solution but the only car I found that runs on water, which is amazing, is called River Simple out of Wales. And I've tried to get hold of them and they haven't got back to me, but I would love to try one out and have a go in it. Um, I think they're doing amazing things, so I'll put that link in as well. But for now, the hybrid feels like the fair option. Um, and hopefully I'll keep it for three years and then go full electric after that. Yes, then my friend Joe Forrester Walker sent me a video of our other friend called Sam Hatfield doing a presentation. <laughs> At the Paris Climate Conference in 2015, the nations of the world agreed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. This is a good target. 
It's a level of warming that humans could adapt to relatively easily. But Our how kids wicked smart, by the way. It? Well, the level of global warming is determined primarily by how much carbon dioxide or CO2 we emit. If we want a limit on global warming, then it follows that there is a finite amount of carbon dioxide that we are allowed to emit. We call this. So, for any of you guys who are confused before you started looking into this, global warming, global heating, is directly correlated to CO2 and how much we're putting into the atmosphere. It's pretty damn simple in that regard. More CO2, more warming. We can only do one and a half percent more. So, what is our budget? How much carbon dioxide have we emitted? And how much more are we allowed to emit? We don't know the numbers for certain, but the best estimates for the total budget are around 2,800 gigatons of CO2. Now, that's a pretty hard number to get your head around, so let me demonstrate some of these duplo blocks. Each one of these blocks represents 150 gigatons of CO2, so we have 2,800 in total. Now, that is an astronomical number, but of course, we've been burning fossil fuels for 200 years now, so we've actually already spent most oh, of Oh, this our is budget. the total carbon budget. If we want to know how much we have left, we simply subtract everything we've spent thus far. So in the 19th century, we emitted just half a block of CO2 emissions. This is when America and Europe began their industrialization. In the 20th century, we emitted a whopping nine and a half blocks of CO2 as that industrialization accelerated and spread around the globe. And in the 21st century, we're only 20 years in and we've already emitted five blocks worth of CO2, leaving us with only three blocks. This is everything that we are allowed to emit if we want to stay under 1.5 degrees of warming. Okay, those maths are ridiculous. If you think that since I was 13, five blocks of carbon, and for the rest of my life, which hopefully is another, I don't know, 50 years, so three two to three times that, we've only got three-fifths of the budget. That's drastic. That is chronically dramatic. That ain't just going hybrid, is it? And at the current rate of emissions, we would have spent the entire budget within 15 years. Now, I haven't told the entire story. Actually, we are allowed to go over budget. So, 15 years, that means I'm 48. Might have 10-year-old kids by that point, if I'm lucky. As long as we promise to pay it back later by sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and storing it. This is what we call negative emissions. And it's a little bit like paying back an overdraft with your bank account. The problem is, it is an extremely expensive process. Removing just one block's worth of CO2 from the atmosphere is estimated to cost around 12 trillion pounds. So what he's saying is, we can emit more carbon than three blocks, but for every block more, it's going to cost us 12 trillion pounds. And so I guess the question becomes, what's the most effective way cost-effective and fun to do and easy to do within the time frames, 15 years that matter, that can actually give us more budget. The best time to reduce emissions is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sam Hatfield, legend, um, and Joe Forrester-Walker for sending it over to me. Look, I don't want to stop flying altogether. I don't want to stop that altogether. Actually, I got a speaking gig offer in Marrakesh in September, and I found myself after the last video saying to them, I'm happy to come and fly, but would you just ask, because they're paying me to go as well, which is quite a bit more than the price of a ticket, would you be willing to just put the same again into a carbon offset? And uh, the agent seemed happy with that. To be fair, they haven't confirmed the booking yet, so maybe that did put them off, but that's me trying to go, I don't think a carbon offset is enough. For a flight, it might be like 12 quid or something, but I think we need to be putting in 50 or 100% of the flights because we need to invest in innovation as well. We need to invest in the future of that whole system, not just doing the bare minimum if we are going to be one of the few privileged ones, especially travel for business, not just your once a year or once every other year holiday. And then the question becomes, what is the most effective way to increase the carbon budget? So then I was led on to the idea, and given that I lived in the trees for a year, what if we plant trees? And a friend, Andy, Andy Smith, introduced me to this guy in Kenya that is currently planting trees. And I've sent him $10 on transfer wise, and I'm going to see if he plants them or not. And then I it got me thinking, could I plant a field of trees to cover my future carbon emissions so that I end my life carbon neutral or carbon positive. So I googled it and found out 
that a tree living 40 years can capture on average one tonne of CO2. I also looked at a list of trees that capture the most carbon and amongst them are pine trees and that suits me well because the reason I loved living in the Scots Pines for the first year was because one, the business of trees is fascinating. It's the only business cycle I am aware of that goes beyond a five-year period. Um, most businesses take a month or three months or a day to run a full cycle, but the trees take 120 years. So that means you have to think five generations ahead when you're planting trees for forestry of what will society need in 120 years. And the trees I was in were planted for pulp and the ones down the road were planted for matches. And how much has the world changed in that period of time? So it's fascinating thinking with a longer term mindset. Also, being in pine trees reminds me of Norway and Canada and Japan. Not that I actually spent time in the trees in Japan, but I've read a lot and looked a lot at them. Of Eastern Europe, in Slovenia, and indeed in my woods in the Scots Pines. I then sent this information to the landowner on my estate, and he sent me an article very interesting article back saying planting more trees can actually save the planet so why aren't we doing it okay i'm just going to read this whole paragraph but to be clear not all trees are equal a tree planted in the year-round warm and humid climate near the equator the tropics grows much quicker than a tree planted in the cold climate of the uk which has a marked winter season i specialize in forest ecology and based on my calculations in 10 years time a silver birch planted in the uk will have a trunk diameter of 10 centimeters storing four kilograms of CO2, but a tree planted in the tropics in the same 10 years will have double the diameter and store a significant 44 kilograms of CO2. So that's 10 times potentially the amount of CO2 capture in 10 years. So that means it is important where we plant these trees. Then I was sent an interesting article on The Guardian saying let nature do it, saying that we only have 13% of woodland cover compared to the European average of 37%, we be in the UK. It's very expensive to plant trees, but there's a much more effective way of re-establishing trees in the wider countryside than putting a spade in the ground, and one that has far greater benefits for biodiversity, carbon sequestration, and the tree's health, and that would save us a fortune in financial and environmental costs, and that is natural regeneration. Let the trees plant themselves. And it is true that only really hedges and woodlands and verges are the last remaining bastions of biodiversity in the UK countryside. I'm kind of imagining that, like, let's say I managed to get a field where we can plant trees, that you would put in some key plantations and then leave room for the scrub and the shrub to grow up around it to facilitate some of this self-pollination that happens. So kind of a mixture between, well, minimum viable structure, basically, putting in some keystone plantations, basically giving it a starter pack and then letting nature do its course. But the key thing here is that we only have 15 years to add to our budget before we bust ourselves. So one of the other methods that I've been told is far better that for storing carbon than trees is peat. And I was sent this by CO Doherty. I captured my Instagram chat with her. She works for like the national parks and she was showing me these peat restoration projects and saying that peat captures an absolutely unbelievable amount of carbon and it is like a history lesson uh, and there is a lot of peat around the world but it's in the very northern parts of the map and I care about global solutions that we can all feel that we're connected on the same journey on the same path participating in the same story the main nuts thing I read about peat is that um sounds like I'm talking about a geezer down the pub Okay, so the Scottish peatlands store 1.7 billion tonnes of carbon. This is 140 years worth of Scotland's total annual greenhouse emissions. I went on and learned more about peat though, and I think I'm right in saying that it only grows, you can only develop new peat by one centimetre every 100 years. So that means in the time frame we're talking about, we would only get 1.5 millimeters of new peat, even if you found the right conditions. So what they're doing is amazing because they're restoring old peatlands to make sure it's capturing as much or at least not releasing out, someone will correct me, but either capturing more or not releasing out old carbon that it was capturing. So really good, but not necessarily the, ne the best next step for us all to be able to take together. 
let's have a little recap. Does flying matter? Yes. Is it one of the worst things you can do? Yes. Am I going to stop flying? Hopefully not. Is there enough carbon budget left for us to live happily ever after? No. How long do we have to sort it out? 15 years. So either reduce, live like a hippie, that's probably part of the solution. But secondly, what can we each be doing as part of our normal lifestyle to keep increasing our carbon budget in micro ways that we can all feel that we're part of the same story? You can do different things. But one of the things that seems most ubiquitous and easy and empowering is planting trees wherever we plant them and letting some land go back to biodiversity to allow nature to do some of the sweat to reduce the cost. Obviously, it's terrible that the Amazon's burning at an unprecedented rate. Well, at all, but especially at an unprecedented rate. But what it highlights to me is something quite interesting about transnationalism. I don't think we're in a place anymore where nation states should have the power to play with global tools. Bolsonaro in Brazil should no longer have the power to decide what to do with our global lungs. That should be down to a global consortium because it has global ramifications. And this is, for me, is another example of how the nation state paradigm as a power broking system is breaking down where people can feel that it's wrong but yet are so disconnected from the power system because we're not members of that nation state so the question is what the hell do we do with all of this stuff and I came up with an idea a long long time ago when I was first deep in the woods and I wrote a couple of medium articles which I'll link in as you know, what I care about is keeping the mind and body, the city and country, the on and off grid all connected. And that anybody who thinks we need to run away into techno utopia or anybody thinks that we need to run back to the woods um, in a Luddite fashion, I don't get on board with. I believe that we need both and we need to keep the mind and body connected. So with the advances in blockchain, and I haven't wanted to get lost in that in the world of ICOs where I've seen some of my friends raise like 120 million quid in like literally hours as they release their ICO and then probably spend the next 10 years of their life trying to deliver on it. ICO means initial coin offering. It's basically going public with a blockchain decentralized organization. And so bear with me on this one. But if you go back to the history of modern money, fiat currency as we know it, it used to be gold backed, which basically meant that your banknote was simply a receipt. It was a receipt for the gold bar that you had in the vault that the banker, the security guard for the vault, basically was looking after for you and he gave you a receipt. And then what happened over time is that the security guard for the vault realized that nobody came to get all their gold bars at the same time, that if, if there was 10 of us who all had a gold bar in there, that he could print an 11th note, an 11th receipt, and that meant that he had more money to give out to lend to people and to make money for himself. So that went from 10 gold bars and 10 notes to 10 gold bars and 11 notes. It then went all the way down to what we call fractional reserve, where there was only 10% of gold. So there was 10 gold bars, but 100 notes out in circulation being used for trading in value and currency and paying people for things. We now operate in fiat currencies all around the world where there is zero gold back. There are no vaults anymore. There is barely any notes anymore. We're just doing it all digitally. So for me, that is just as pie in the sky as these digital blockchain cryptocurrency IPOs or ICOs that are not tethered to anything. So here's the problem I'm interested in solving. How do we capture more carbon to increase our budget so we don't have to just live like hippies? How do we start to build a power system that means people like Bolsonaro are kept in a box and don't get to make ecological global level decisions? And how do we keep a connection between the boutique biological beauty and the unbelievable breadth and opportunity with the digital realm? Return to our original humanity of being a tribe but now at a global level, rather than having to give in to the hierarchical structures that we've needed to build the industrialized world. And so here's my working idea. What if we open a tree-backed currency? Instead of representing a gold bar in a vault, it represents a new tree that has been planted somewhere in the world. And it also, by proxy, represents a certain quantity of carbon capture. One tonne if it lasts 40 years, three tonnes if it lasts 120. For me, that's more valuable than having a gold-backed currency because we 
can't you can't breathe or eat gold <laughs> bars apart from the ones that you buy at the supermarket which are unbelievably underrated as irony would have it they're like 10p a gold bar and they should be like one pound 50 as far as i'm concerned anyway that's a whole different issue if you know you know if you let me know if you've eaten those gold bars they are boomtastic anyway we need trees to breathe and we can plant one extra tree in my garden here we can plant five trees in your school in terms of value in terms of meaningfulness of a currency i can't think of anything more meaningful than the coins we trade with digitally or in the analog representing trees that have new trees that have been planted specifically to handle the carbon sequestering budget increase thing that we need and that would mean that our Kenyan friend could get paid in Corco coins. Let's say he plants 10 trees. For argument's sake, he could earn 10 Corco coins. He could then keep them as an investment. He could trade them. Or he could, yeah, he could sell them for fiat currency. Like I might pay two pounds to buy one of his Corco coins and by proxy one of his trees that he's planted from him in order to essentially offset my carbon. So what I was asking the landowner, can I plant a field worth of trees? Maybe I could crowdsource the trees that sequester my personal carbon from all over the world. And so that means that no coins would exist that don't have a tree to back them up. And we could geolocate each and every tree. And if you went to visit a tree and you saw it had one of these corco type signs on it, you could look and see the history of the tree. Who planted it? Who bought it? When was the coin that's associated with it traded? And what is the history of that tree, both in currency and analog terms? I've got a bunch of questions that, again, I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts on. One, does that sound right to you? It sounds really good to me. And it's been something that's brewing in the background for a long, long time. Two, how do we prove the existence? We need to make sure that we, we're not getting uh, deep faked, that all these trees are getting planted and we're sending out coins to people that haven't actually done the work. How do we prove that it's growing? So how often do we need to check in on that tree? Every five years, every one year? You don't want it to be too laborious. You don't want it to become a part-time job, but we also want to make sure it's genuine. Could we have two trusted people from within the network taking photos and kind of proving its existence? Could be quite a fun pastime for people, a bit like, um, what's it called, geotagging? If people go looking for the little things in the countryside how do we incentivize or manage for appropriateness so i don't i wouldn't want you to be incentivized to plant let's say bamboo because it's really fast growing if we were like rewarding based on the size of the tree or the carbon capture of the tree i don't know if that's a good thing because it might incentivize you to plant a tree that's not natural for your environment it's not we can't get too crude or reductive about it purely being about carbon. We have to live in this world too, so we need to make something that feels right and looks right and engages with what's already there in a good way as well. Yeah, and how do we consider the carbon value? So it's not just aesthetics, but do we pay all the coin on day one when you plant the tree? I think we need to front load it in order to get people excited about it and take the risk. Like, I think 40 years is a good period of time, or maybe, maybe 20. I pay half up front and half on completion like I do with my creative projects. Could be. Could be worth two coins and you get one up front and one after 20 years or one after 40 years. Also, don't forget that this is this could be a real platform where the trees you're planting could be apple trees making fruit. Tell me if you think I'm going crazy, but I think this could be the most valuable currency. So for me, the biggest competitor, I guess, in this kind of idea is something like Libra by Facebook, which is owned by a corporation, which doesn't smell good. So I'd rather have something open that's owned by the people in a mutual fashion and is rooted in reality, the analog reality. If there comes a point where we learn how to survive our consciousness, which is really what we are, without needing to depend on the biological world, for example, we find a digital way of respirating our consciousness, then we could live in the cloud somewhere, potentially. Until we do that, we need the trees to fill our lungs with oxygen and fill our kids' lungs with oxygen. So I'm currently looking at different ICO platforms that could help us facilitate this. And I guess unless I get some good advice after this video, my next step is to try to get one tree planted 
and one coin or one set of coins created, try and store the correct data to prove that it's worth releasing the coin for that tree. Oh, and then get someone to try and break it. And if we can do it, prove it's real, try and get someone to break the system and they fail, then maybe we can do it again. And then maybe we can tell our Kenyan friend and then maybe some others can do it too. Bernard is his name, I've just remembered. All right, anyway, I hope you guys are following my logic. We've got to figure some stuff out. We can't wait for corporations to do it. We can sign some petitions. We can lobby some ministers. All of that stuff's already in the links. And if you've got other stuff, please do send it. Also, we've got to get on with being creative as well. Otherwise, we're going to have very awkward conversations with our kids when we get older. Oh, I did, did have a little think about that at one point. Everyone was sharing videos, and then I just forgot about it. And um, yeah, sorry, it's too hot now. I'd rather say I was doing this, and I actually managed to plant some trees and do some stuff, create some currency, help Bernard, and, uh, and it still wasn't enough. That would be a lot easier. Anyway, don't want to be a downer. I'm having a lot of fun, actually, on this rabbit hole. I hope you guys are enjoying the journey, too. I will stick this video on YouTube and on Instagram, IGTV, because it will be Long John Silver. I'll be in the woods again in the autumn. We're brewing up the swirl. I'm going to put in a link to all of the open projects I'm working on with Corcovado right now. If you want to get involved, please do with any of them. I need help. There's so much going on. Oh, and the exciting news is I am starting a new podcast. I've got a couple of great guests lined up already. People you will have heard of, some that you won't. And it's going to be called, unless you give me some strong feedback right now, it's going to be called New Agreements. And the reason is, is because we're trying to rebuild a world and we're going to have to keep rebuilding it. We're going to have to get very agile in, in adapting our systems on an ongoing basis as part of our everyday lifestyle, adapting our own mindset. So what new agreements do we need to make with ourselves? What new agreements do we need in our households about the roles in the home and how we do relationships and how we think about each other on a basic human to human level? And how do we think about the agreements we need all over society, all around the world, within our councils, our nations, and our global community, our global tribe? How the heck do we figure out what new agreements we need in order to survive, stay adaptable to the future that we're facing? Yeah, not just make some changes once, but actually begin to get into a rhythm of continually expecting not just the rules to change, but the rules that govern the rules to change as well. So it's all about new agreements. And so I'm going to be asking different people that I've met and some new friends use the podcast to meet some new people as well about what do they think of when they think of new agreements in their life? What do they think that we should be exploring and considering? And I don't know, it could even make up a bit of a, a policy list or something like that or an area, areas of focus as we go through these conversations. And maybe I'll do little, just thinking on my feet now, but maybe we'll do little reflection, reflection videos like this on all the links that were shared and um, as we educate ourselves and figure out a way of viewing things. I hope you enjoy this. I like doing it. It's quite easy to do as well because I'm just sitting here on my own. As long as the neighbours don't get too loud. Feels good. Feels good. Feels good to be doing something. I'm enjoying it. I'll see you guys soon. Take care of yourselves, look after each other and give me some comments.